evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Arthur Vaughn. I'm the Health and Wellness Chairman for the 100 Black Men of North Metro Atlanta. And I'd like to welcome you to the next in our virtual health and wellness series, where we're going to discuss where we are with the COVID-19 pandemic and steps we can all do to protect ourselves and ensure our kids have a great year. By way of housekeeping, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. We will be monitoring the chat and answering your questions from there. We'd like to start off with a quick video that Morehouse School of Medicine, um, the network, uh, excuse me, Morehouse School of Medicine, 100 Black Men of America, and the National COVID Resil Resiliency Network has done. And then we'll start with the introduction of our panelists and go right into our uh, virtual conversation. <laughs> And I'd like to take a moment to read an abbreviated, abbreviated bios for each of our panelists today. They are incredibly well accomplished and we could spend an hour reading their accolades. So I had to abbreviate it slightly. We'd like to start off with Dr. Shah, who has spent just under 20 years with Walgreens, serving in various roles of progressive leadership. He currently serves as an area health supervisor in the Atlanta market. We are happy to have Walgreens as a health and wellness partner, both nationally and locally. We have Dr. Tabia Henry Atentobi. She is the principal investigator of the Morehouse School of Medicine Prevention Research Center, the first institutionally designated center advancing community-based participatory research competitively funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She leads the Georgia Community Engagement Alliance, also known as SEAL, against COVID-19 disparities funded by the National Institutes of Health and represents Morehouse School of Medicine and other collaborations. Next, we have Dr. Griggs. He is a health and wellness, oh, sorry, Dr. Griggs is his health and wellness persona of Dr. Eric D. Griggs, MD, a New Orleans-based community medicine doctor and health educator who has dedicated his professional life to raising health and wellness awareness in communities nationally and internationally. In 2020, the world was affected by the global pandemic of the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. Since then, Dr. Griggs has become a local, national, and international figure in explaining the risks, exposure, care, prevention, and treatment for COVID-19. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that Dr. Griggs also joins me as a member of the 100 Black Men of America's Health and Wellness uh, Committee. So with that said, we're going to start. Hey, Dr. Griggs, when we uh, talk about COVID-19 and we talk about this pandemic, there are phases or within a, any pandemic. Can you give us some insight on, on where we are in the pendulum that, that talks about the different phases or the different steps within um, any pandemic? 
Ah, well, first of all, Dr. Vaughn, thank you for having me. Uh, uh, this is always an honor and a pleasure when you're able to share uh, some of your experiences to try to make things better for, for our community. Uh, you know, we are, we are at a stage now. Uh, I think a lot of us in this pandemic, some people think we're further along than we actually are. Uh, we are still in a pandemic. We are, are working on the social portion of this thing becoming uh, an endemic, meaning something that can be localized to different regions and that we can live with. Uh, we're actually in the phase where we're learning to live around the virus. Uh, a lot of people are having issues with acceptance as though thinking as though this thing is going to go, go mm -hmm. away. Um, one thing that we, we do know is that uh, we need to start paying attention and learning from patterns uh, as kids. We learned that if we put our hand on the stove, took one time, it got burned, you wouldn't do it again. For the last three years, uh, we know uh, that between October and January, roughly the numbers are going to start to slowly tick up and we'll have a fall surge. We also know, behavior-wise, that when the spring comes out and the, the cold weather goes away, we all get excited. We're ready to take off the hats, the coats. And we're also, a lot of people mistakenly want to take off their mask and do away with all precautions that that we that helped us get through this. For the last three summers, uh, we've tried to convince ourselves that we have a, a summer cold or a, a, a summer flu or my, my allergies are acting up. Uh, the first year it was I can't smell or taste because it's allergies. And it wasn't, it was alpha or delta, alpha. Uh, the second year, um, my sinuses are bothering me and I have a, <clears throat> I have a headache. Uh, it wasn't anything it was Delta. The third year, third year, three, time, three times the charm, uh, we start saying that I have a sore throat, <clears> throat> a sore throat, and a, a sneeze, I have a, have a really bad summer cold. No, it's, it's Omicron subvariants. So if we would start paying attention to the, the things that, that have been taking place and using common sense and mother wit, knowing that we're going to have to protect ourselves during those times, things will get a lot better. Uh, things are getting a lot better. Uh, I don't like using the term, um, but as as we, I, I still say that we are in a pandemic. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. All right, all right. Well, thank you again. When you guys have questions, please, please put them in the chat. We want to have a dialogue, and we want to make sure you guys are well informed. Dr. Shah, you're we've been working with your team for the better part of the last year, year and a half on setting up vaccination sites, both nationally and locally. Tell us what's going on in the vaccine world, not only with uh, COVID-19 vaccines, but also the other vaccines that we, we, we commonly get. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Juan, for this invitation. I'm very fortunate. I feel really, uh, you know, honored that I'm a part of this, uh, this knowledge sharing communication going on around around the pandemic and others. The vaccination or I would say immunization world is not new for us, right? It's uh, we, we have seen for many, many years and I'm sure everybody very well aware of influenza vaccine because vaccine, the flu vaccine is, is very popular uh, for many decades. But when we talk, I, I really wanted to start with uh, with the COVID vaccination and COVID, uh, you know, while because Dr. Greg already set a very good stage, <laughs> I just wanted to just add a little bit on it. Uh, you know, when we compare with the January of even this year, uh, we are much better than what we were at that point. But if we compare just a three, four months back, right in March and April, we are heading to the wrong direction. So. Nothing, you know, a, a, to the point that, you know, it was like a big killer, but definitely COVID cases is in the rise. But the death is not as bad and the credit goes to vaccination. And I think, you know, we are very uh, confidently now we can say that the vaccine works. Uh, the COVID definitely have proven that. I was actually reading one recent article uh, that was kind of eye-catching to me that, you know, uh, it shows that the in Georgia particularly, we are in Georgia, and I'm sure some folks are out of Georgia, but I'm just specifically talking about 
the health official was talking about that the immunization went down in Georgia while we are dealing with the COVID, COVID uh, you know, pandemic. And overall routine immunization, when it goes down, it's actually scary because we have eradicated some serious disease state and we don't want those come back if we don't continue doing a routine vaccination. So considering that, you know, what Walgreens, and I'm being very proud of a member of Walgreens, what we do is we offer all kinds of vaccines. Means you just name it, pretty much we, we do offer. We only allowed certain vaccinations um, because of the Board of Pharmacy allowed us, uh, you know, but like three years and older, the COVID and flu vaccination, anyone in our community can able to go to Walgreens and get protected. We do offer other vaccinations like pneumococcal pneumonia, shingles, you know, whooping cup. Those are some of the popular ones that uh, most of our adults are usually eligible to get that. We are, every day, our Walgreens team members are ready to protect our patients. Uh, so, you know, I think the immunization world, we are playing our part. I just need to call out here that our community need to be aware of this option is available and they need to do their part to get protected. That's what I can say that I can, um, you know, this, this awareness will help hopefully to, to inspire them. And speaking of awareness leads right into a great question for Dr. Akintobi. Doc, through 100 Black Men of North Metro Atlanta through a small grant it's called, right? is working with Georgia Seal and HealthWorks to increase awareness and increase the number of vaccinations. Can you tell us about your work in that area and what we're doing to touch communities that are disproportionately getting uh, the virus and getting ill from it? Can you tell us what's going on in that space to help us out? Absolutely. And Dr. Vaughn, so honored to be here with all the folks that could have done could have been anywhere else today and chose to be with us to talk about where we are with the pandemic. So um, there are a couple of, of um, links that we'll drop in the chat and a, a few slides that we can share. But in short, uh, Georgia Seal is a community engaged alliance against COVID-19, and it was developed very quickly um, by the National Institutes of Health getting together um, leaders across the state of Georgia. Uh, we're honored that, that they came to us first to make sure that we galvanized health departments, um, federally qualified health centers, and more importantly, um, organizations like 100 Black Men and others who have an established pursuit of trust and trustworthiness um, uh, with communities long before COVID. We're very clear that the path to Dr. Shah, you shared the importance of awareness and, and education on the things that Dr. Griggs talked about. We can have all of the information ready for people, but if it is not through trusted messengers, if the information is not culturally relevant and responsive, and we know that culture is not just race, it's, it's age, it's geography. If those things are not aligned, uh, then we will not be effective and continue to have um, groups, including communities of color who are more likely to get sick and die. Uh, so Georgia Seal was developed then, and I'm not sure if we can share the, the slide on Georgia Seal. Many of the questions that you have or that you're getting from your constituents, we regularly update through our collaboration with NIH, whether you want information on the latest realities um, for children and getting vaccinated. Uh, there's some questions in here about, you know, CDC's relaxed guidelines versus some of the things we know we need to continue to do. Uh, Georgia Seal and HealthWorks are here to do that. So, um, Kamari, if you could drop the Georgia Seal and National uh, Seal Network links in the chat, uh, we want to make sure that we share those resources. So, uh, you can go to this to the next slide. Uh, Dr. Vaughn. So the, the links that I'll share are related to networks that Morehouse School of Medicine is leading. Georgia Seal is one of them. You can go to the click forward is uh, Georgia garnering effective outreach and research in Georgia for impact. So we're not just doing research with, but research um, 
uh, by community leaders across the state of Georgia to be sure that our messages are relevant, that they're translated and co-created so uh, they hopefully impact people's decisions, not just about testing, but also about vaccinations. Next slide, please. And so our board is governed by community leaders. There are very few of us who are clinicians or pharmacists or, or PhDs like Dr. Vaughn and I, uh, because we know that communities must lead in terms of approaches that are sustained um, in fighting COVID and what comes next. So Kamaria already put the link to Georgia SEAL uh, and the National uh, SEAL Network, which has everything you want to know from videos like what Dr. Vaughn shared, uh, as well as information that you can share in all of your networks for people who have questions and need to hear real information from people who look like them. So HealthWorks is the way that Dr. Vaughn and I are reconnected. It's a collaboration between Morehouse, Meharry, as well as a group called Ashland, which is focused on elevating and amplifying the role of small businesses, minority-owned businesses. Next slide, please. And so what SEAL is doing um, in collaboration with HealthWorks, can go um, forward to the next slide is to really make sure that we get with community-based organizations uh, and other um, national chapters that are based in states, particularly Tennessee and Georgia, who frequently we are hot for all of the wrong reasons when we think about health outcomes, uh, usually dead last or uh, have more of us who are not doing well. Health work is designed to promote community outreach, vaccinations, in Georgia we've had over 70,000 Georgians vaccinated and really encouraging people to have their employees think about vaccination, um, particularly with super spreader businesses and super spreader events. And 100 Black Men, because of your reach and network through Dr. Vaughn and other is, others is one of the recipients of those grants. Next slide, please. So lots of community events that are happening through Morehouse and through groups like 100 Black Men and, and many of you. If you are interested in us hosting an event with you or interested in materials and the ways that we can show up to support you, that is what we're here for. Your trust plus our education and information hopefully result, will, will help to turn the tide and increase the number of folks who are vaccinated. Next slide, please. Here are some of our materials. We can get these things to you. Uh, so certainly reach out to us and I'm gonna pass the, the mic back to you, Dr. Vaughn, M much more that, that, that I can answer questions for and share, but this is a great opportunity for you to learn about us and the National COVID Resilience Network, which we lead through Morehouse School of Medicine to touch every group and region within the United States with information that they can use. Thank you, Dr. Akintobi, and thank you for all the kind words about our chapter, North Metro Atlanta chapter of 100 Black Men and our partnership. I want to go to one of the questions that somebody put in the chat, and I'm going to come back to you, Dr. Griggs. So if we're still in a pandemic, why is the CDC relaxing guidelines going into the fall and with our children heading back to school? <laughs> so that thank you. That's a, a great question. Uh, believe it or not, that yeah, that's another question. That we, we that's been asked a million times throughout the pandemic. This is the same question resurfacing again. Uh, as we know, as we're learning to live through uh, this pandemic, this is something that's unprecedented. Uh, there are no concrete answers. If there were a playbook, it would be a lot easier. Uh, what's happening is we're we're making the playbook now. Um, as we're trying to figure out how to keep the economy going, how to keep the 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 school, the kids in school, and how to adjust. The vaccine, the virus actually is, is mutating and it's learning and it's learned as most viruses do to become more infectious over the courses of time um, and less, less, less virulent or, or lethal. Now, as long as we see, keep, keep seeing these, these mutations follow this course, we're fine. The problem is, is uh, any scientist will tell you uh, that uh, things don't always go the way that they planned uh, and the possibility that just one small mutation off the spike or in another direction could send us back to close to square one. So what you're seeing is an adjustment. Uh, again, over the course of the pandemic, you've seen recommendations now. Uh, I wanna make something clear. These are, these are only recommendations. Uh, the CDC makes their recommendations based on the best data uh, that they take in, but we get the data 
from all over the world. They take it, they condense it, and they make their recommendations uh, in conjunction with what they, they find. And we can make policy, can, the operative word is can, choose to make policy accordingly. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we do know is that the, some of the best protection in the world has come from moms and grandmoms and granddads and dads all over the world. Uh, uh, if there's danger, we know how to keep their, our kids away. Uh, and we learn lessons. COVID-19 is one of the one of the times we finally publicly publicly acknowledged by we call it anecdotal research or anecdotal observations that some of the things that the good habits like how many years have we trying to been trying to get kids and people in general to wash their hands? <laughs> Duh, we need a randomized clinical trial to tell you that. Um, so what what you're noticing is you're going to note notice the, the expansion and contraction of the recommendations as you see with the policies as we find out what can be most most protected, is that, if, if that makes sense. It does, it does. And Dr. Shah, just yesterday, to build on, on what Dr. Griggs just said, washing your hands is a start. But yesterday, we talked about some other things that you were suggesting that can also, we, we can, as our kids are going back into school and the runny noses and the coughing, and I drop my door off at school. Some kids have on sweatshirts. It's 100 degrees in Georgia. I don't know how you're going to get on a sweatshirt. And, and some of them have on just the minimum required not to get put out of school. <laughs> um, right? Uh, so, so what do we do? You know, what are we telling our kids? Because remember, this is a back to school conversation. What do, can we tell our kids? mama, grandma, dad, uncle, whomever, caregiver, before you walk out the door, what can some of, what can our kids do in addition to washing their hands to help reduce the likelihood? We're mitigating risk. We can't eliminate risk, right? We just want to reduce the risk. What, what can we talk to, tell our kids to do? Great question. And I, you know, I, I think it's a fear on every parent's mind right now, right? That, hey, my baby, which loved the most, you know, it's going back in the school and now it's going to be in front of many other kids and school known to create or spread the germs the most because we, we think that, you know, the kids did not stay and maintain the hygiene. Mm -hmm. But that's not true. Actually, just I think the awareness is very important. Last couple of years taught us a lot. Uh, and I think... If we self-aware that, you know, some of the symptoms of COVID or even any other sickness, like, you know, fever, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, muscle ache, headache, you know, the loss of taste and smell, like Dr. Griggs talked about, you know, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, those are the symptoms that clearly define that, yes, that person is sick. And if somebody is sick, they should stay home with their mama, with their daddy to take care of themselves, right? If we do that, I think we stop that spread of the germs. And that is really key call out. The second thing, actually, I'm thinking we should all have a COVID test at home. You know, government did an amazing job. Health and Human Services did an amazing job to gave you know the OTC COVID test to everyone to have it at home. If a child saw any symptoms that what we just talked about, test them at home. And if we early detect that yes, that child is COVID positive, I'll isolate that per, you know that child, make sure take care of the hydration, make sure eat and that the child eat healthy and well, very well rested. Those are the things being proactive to stop spreading at the school and school will spread everywhere because our kids then go hang out with others, come back home, bring the germs back home. So definitely keep washing the hands, washing the hands. I don't know how many times Dr. Griggs, we need to continue to talk about it, right? But that is very, very important. Be aware of those symptoms, what we just talked about. And if someone doesn't have OTC COVID test at home, you know, even Georgia Medicaid pays for it. Any health, major health insurance pays for it. They just need to go to their local Walgreens. And I'm, I can only talk to the Walgreens because I know Walgreens very well. I don't know about others. But our Walgreens is right within three, four miles of many of our communities, I'm telling you. Well, I'll be at Walgreens tomorrow. 
begin. All right. Go to there. Show your insurance card. You know, <laughs> show your Medicaid card. Whatever you have, and see that your insurance covers. Most okay. of the major insurance covers eight tests a month. I'm going to tell them I know you. That's all I need, right? I just told them I know you. What insurance? Hey, but I have a follow-up question because I do have a question for Dr. Akatobi. Why don't I ask a follow-up? So I was looking at one of my blue boxes, my COVID-19 uh, test kits, right? Mm -hmm. It had an expiration date on it. Who knew? How long are these things good for? And, did, and, and the rest of our audience may not even realize that these things have expiration dates. I guess the fluid becomes bad at some point. Can you? Can anybody talk to us about you know what we need to do to make sure these eight kits we have or the eight kits we can get are actually giving us right information when they actually expire? That sounds like a question for Dr. Shah, but I think in this case, we certainly would want to mind the expiration dates. I know oftentimes we don't for other things, but Dr. Shah, please take it. <laughs> so I, mean, I, I wish I can tell you black and white answer, but it's it's not that easy. I can tell you one thing, what we learned from the COVID vaccination, that we only have a certain data and it's very hard to prove that you know, beyond certain date, something is not good because we don't have enough study time to really prove that. So initially when the vaccine came, we got a beyond use date that so do not use beyond so-and-so date. Then they continue expanding based on the more and more data is available. So I would suggest that whoever has the box that says it's reaching to the expiration date, there is a high possibility that they have extended that expiration. So they should reach out to the manufacturer and confirm that this test is not good. It's really very hard. It's not really truly expiration date. It's like more beyond use date. <laughs> Sounds like the same thing to me. <laughs> <laughs> I want you all to know, uh, Dr. Shah uh, tested positive this week, and he's isolating himself clearly <clears throat> somewhere in Florida. Look at his background. He said he told the excuse to get away from his wife and kids to go on vacation, you know, but he's still here with us today. And we want to thank you, even though you're home recovering from COVID. Uh, we appreciate you being here with us and, oh. and not actually infecting your coworkers. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dr. Akintobi, so, so. I have this, and I have no problem saying this. I have a twin sister. She and I go back and forth about COVID all the time. She is a COVID uh, resilient. I mean, she 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 thinks you know it's the it's nothing more than a bad flu, uh -huh. right? So how do we have these conversations with our friends and family members who are vaccine hesitant? All right. Who, who, despite the number of freezer trucks, I'm from New York, right? So I told her, I said, all those freezer yes. trucks in New York with bodies was there because, you know, it was a bad flu. Right, right. <laughs> how, how do we have these conversations that, to try to not beat people up, but to educate them to decrease this vaccine hesitancy? Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, you know, we're we're trying to change our language, but, you know, the hesitancy has been in the ether since this started, but... You know, I think before you can educate someone um, and tell them what you think they should do, or at least put, expose them to all the options to keep themselves safe with vaccinations being the ultimate goal, is you got to acknowledge, acknowledge where they are, right? So most hesitancy is it's coming from a, a place that is likely justified. I know some of us wouldn't, some people wouldn't agree with me, uh, but you know, if the hesitancy is related to, and this is depending on age and era of some people related to what they, they think they know about uh, Tuskegee or Henrietta Lacks, it, 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 it needs to be acknowledged. If it's related to ensuring that these vaccinations are, you know, de were developed by um, scientists and others um, who represent black and brown communities, you know, or their concerns about engaging in research, we have to acknowledge the hesitancy. Most of it is justified. The truth is, you know, the way that I've, I've um, chosen to have conversations with family members, because those are the toughest ones, um, over time is that, you know, you not being ready is actually okay. Uh, before you make any important decision in your life, you should get all of the facts and the science, right? Uh, by From someone that you trust, 
uh, to be able to make the right decision. So acknowledging uh, where everyone is and what their why is, is important. And I think providing them with, with information that you know they might trust. Maybe they don't trust uh, the National Institutes or CDC, but they might trust you, right? Um, and then the other thing is to really make it personal. I know for my, uh, my parents who are in their 70s, you know, my dad was not thinking about getting the vaccination, but he sure did want to go to New York to visit his twin uh, um, grandsons who were born a year ago. Best believe he hurried up and got that vaccine because there was something that he needed or cared about that was was blocking him. Uh, and that was getting the vaccination. You know, the other thing I would would stop with, you know, a lot of people like us who feel like we're healthy or like my 19-year-old daughter who and 15-year-old son who think that they're healthy or those in that 18 to 25 who think, you know, whatever it is, I'll get it and I'll bounce back because I'm young. When we've been able to talk to them about stories um, of them bringing COVID home and they bounce back, but their elderly grandmother does not make it. Who do you love enough or who cares about you? Uh, that would make you think not just about your own bounce back, but maybe not the bounce back of somebody else you care about. So making it personal and even talking about your own experience. Dr. Shah is recovering now. I was recovering about three weeks ago. And before that, it was my, my two kids and my husband just last week. And we know all the things to do. So as Dr. Shah said, life happens, things happen, and this thing can slip through. So making it personal and saying, the reason why mine was not as bad, and I still don't want it again, is because I got the vaccine. So That's making true. it personal and acknowledging where people are. I told my sister, I said, hey, you know, I had a heart transplant in 2019. I'm really not trying to be around you right now unvaccinated, right? As I, so I said, you saw me in the hospital on a ventilator. I never want to be on a ventilator again. It's one of the worst experiences ever to wake up strapped down, right? So I said, so I'll see you via Zoom until you decide to show me a, a card because <laughs> I don't believe you. But before we move on, I want to acknowledge uh, Kamaria Glover. She's one of the community health workers with uh, Georgia Seal partners with us. I'm sure she's one of the people returning the many, many emails I send over, which feels like daily. And she does it in a, a very gracious and kind way and, and never tells me, hey, bro, stop sending me stuff. <laughs> but thank you for all you do, Ms. Glover. And we also have our president, Bernard Johnson, on the line. And we always like to acknowledge our leadership uh, when he joins us. Uh, but I want to get back to these questions. So, Dr. Shah, I'm going to jump back to you. Someone asked, you know, how many over-the-counter tests can or should a family have on hand? Yeah, hey, this is a great question. I tried to answer. I don't know. It's uh, I can able to answer properly or not. But uh, so minimum two is needed. That's uh, that's I would say minimum requirement. And I always say that don't stay in a minimum. The reason is when you somebody tested positive, they need to have another test to confirm that they are now negative before they really you know, expose themselves in the community. So that's one thing. That's why the two is the minimum. I always recommend that the reason why, you know, the eight is set standard is because we wanted to make sure we protect the whole family. We make sure that we have enough tests for not just our own family, but for our neighbors, for our friends and our extended families. So that's why in Unfortunately, the reality is not everybody is as aware as some of us right now who is listening, who is talking here. So we like to have as many you can able to keep it in, on, their hand, on your hand. So if any of your community member, you know, we, you know that, okay, they tested positive. If one individual tested positive, that means the whole family need to test themselves. They may not develop the symptoms yet, but it may coming in, in the next couple of days. The early detection is a key to save lives. And that's why I think the minimum is two, but I would say just don't limit yourself. Go to Walgreens and we'll get you more. There you go. Go to Walgreens and you'll get more. All right. And you can also get your prescriptions filled and a whole lot of other things. So Dr. Grigg, you and I were at, at, at Essence Fest in July for two very different reasons. You were giving uh, 
uh, very educational conversations around COVID-19 and I was experiencing the whole thing for the first time, right? So we're back to having events, large capacity events, whether it's Essence Fest, whether it's an academic conf a conference and high school football in Georgia has already started, right? So what, what do we do? Again, we wanna get back to our kids. What do we tell our kids who are in that, you know, 18 and under, because we're talking about high school, we're talking about uh, secondary school, right? And primary school. How, what, what, what's our message to people who, who think they're invincible, <laughs> whose parents are probably giving them a little more freedom, you know, than I had as a child, or maybe less, I'm not sure, depending on the parent. Uh, but what do we talk to the, the, what's the message that we send home without being, you know, that doom and gloom, fearful thing that no one wants to hear anymore? on how to protect our kids as they're getting back in their, their activities and engagement in the school systems? Well, I mean, first of all, before we have these conversations, we need to lay the, the platform. I mean, it's the same, <laughs> the same as the messaging of our parents to eat your broccoli or your cabbage or your Brussels sprouts or your veggies that you, sorry, I digress. Yeah, the things that we <laughs> think are, are the least healthy and the least desirable are always the things that are the best for us. Uh, we are all tired, we're all fatigued of doom and gloom. And luckily, thanks to vaccines, we're not in a doom and gloom state anymore. Uh, we are, if you're not vaccinated, if you're not careful, if you're careless, there are a minimum of, uh, you know, the, the one thing we tell people is that, the, you know, anytime you said that this is the predominant circulating variant, if something is dominant, it means to be dominating something. Meaning that if this something is most prevalent or the most common, then there are other things below it that are still circulating. There are a minimum of three to four, if not five, different variants still circulating in varying amounts. The one that's predominant is the one that's most common and being passed around right now. With that said, as we move into the fall, the same things that we've been saying to save uh, people from being sick every year, every year prior to COVID, like Dr. Shah alluded to, wash your hands. Keep your hands and your bugs to yourself. Most importantly, as we're talking to our kids, listen to your parents. If you don't want to listen to the science, listen to your parents. If you're sick, I want you to stay home. I don't want you to go around your friends if they're sick. We can take the messaging from COVID but since people are tired. It's like Voldemort. It's that, that which must not be named or said. We don't have to say that name and we can use the common sense things that we've talked about. They're called NPIs, non-pharmacological interventions. And we can subtly work in the messaging as the numbers go up and you start hearing these terms for these viruses, COVID start to go up. You can work the messaging back in. We want you to be even more careful as you're going to see. Uh, the Southern University uh, system down here just re-implemented indoor masking. At this point, people understand why that it, it's not punishment, it's protection. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. And, and by the way, I, I looked in the chat, I'm sorry, Dr. Vaughn, in the chat, and I did go to the FDA site, uh, and if you're concerned about expired tests, there are 22 that are listed on the FDA site, and they do have a link uh, for uh, updates and expirations, and if that's not enough, you can contact the manufacturer. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. See, I told you, we knew who to invite. Dr. Griggs is on it. He's on it. <laughs> so we have another question I thought was sort of interesting. All right. Um... Are we using lessons learned from COVID-19 vaccinations to improve the response concerning monkeypox and other potential pandemics? And can we talk about what monkeypox, because it's really not from a monkey, right? So, <laughs> but can we talk about what it is and what it isn't? And are we learning anything from COVID that we can then apply to that? That's open to anybody who chooses to answer. So I'll lay the groundwork uh, with the basics. Uh, the monkeypox is sitting in the corner with the Spanish flu. Uh, the Spanish flu and the pandemic of, of, of uh, 1918 suffered the same fate. It was not, it did not start in Spain. It was actually Kansas City, from what I understand. But uh, they were the ones that called it out, and there they were. So all of a sudden, the monkey, you can see a monkey sitting there like this, like, what did I do? Monkeypox was actually discovered in the 50s, and the vector uh, is actually rodents. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's actually a cousin of smallpox. Uh, it's infectious, but less lethal cousin of it. We've seen it before. It's been around. We've definitely learned lessons from not only smallpox and not only COVID, um, but you, you can, you've heard it, that we've learned lessons from the pandemic uh, that we're trying to do to stave off uh, monkeypox. And I'll, 
I'll hand it off there and just kind of save the monkey because it's not the monkey's fault. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Gibbs, thank you. Thank you for that, for laying that foundation. I think there are some important roles that folks like you and we play, though, in making sure that the optics um, and the perception related to who is most at risk um, compared to really helping people know that all people can be at risk is, is all that's very important. The health department uh, just called um, me and a few others with Georgia Seal and we're spending a lot of time talking about the fact that the optics and perhaps initially the, those that are disproportionately uh, impacted represent those that may be uh, black men who sleep with men, but the truth is anyone can get it. And so we need to be sure that when we are communicating risk and the opportunity to educate people that we are not amplifying a group that um, uh, quite frankly, in, in Atlanta, uh, many folks are saying you are you are um, disproportionately targeting us uh, when the truth is that anyone can get it. So I think we've learned a lot from the scientific perspective and the history of outbreaks, Dr. Griggs. Um, the challenge is that um, those that may need the vaccine the most, and that really is all of us, um, you know, we may our, our, the, the way that we're communicating may really uh, create a shift in those that might be disproportionately uh, Im impacted, uh, becoming uh, not necessarily the highest at risk. So we need to make sure that we're communicating the equitable risk and that the optics of this don't make people think that only one group is, is susceptible. You know, what, what you just said reminds me, and, and, and if you're of a certain age, when, when we first started a conversation many, many, many decades ago about HIV, right? That's right. It was the same conversation. It was like, oh, the gay men in New York are good. all right. have HIV, but not the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And we learned very quickly that that was not the truth, all right? So we shouldn't demonize or point fingers at any particular population as if you're good, you know, this is God's curse on you and the rest of us are fine. No, that's not true. And it's bad information. And there's a lot of negative connotations and words we could use to associate with people who think that way. That's but right. we don't want to apply that here because it's just simply not true. And we need to learn from that as well, um, not to do those kind of things, right? Um, hey, Dr. Ron, actually, can I, can I just add in Absolutely. this? Because many inquiries we are receiving at Walgreens that, you know, do you have a monkeypox vaccine? Unfortunately, we don't have enough vaccine yet to protect the community. But, and it's the vaccination is actually controlled by the state health department. So if anyone has any question on the vaccination, you know, I think they should reach out to their health provider and I'm sure they have the ways to recommend, to connect with the health department if truly somebody is, you know, showing the symptoms of monkeypox. Absolutely. And Dr. Shah, I want to stay with you for a minute because we were asked is, um, it seems that the rapid test is more readily available than the PCR. Is that been your experience at Walgreens? And if so, is that the case and why? That is true. It's, you know, it's a two different test. Uh, and I'm, I'm not, by all means, not a hundred percent expert on this, but I can tell clinically that the rapid test is much easier to detect because it detects the live virus. If somebody has virus, active virus in their, you know, bodily fluid, it can easily detect. The PCR test is much more in-depth uh, analysis. It's, it's actually not just predict the current virus, current, uh, you know, the, the load of virus, but it's actually predict also that you can somebody have a, just even a stresses of virus. That's why it's a little bit, uh, I would say, more vigorous uh, testing required some time to get the results. That's why it's not as popular. The test is available equally, just not as popular because it takes longer time to get the result. Okay, okay. Well, thank you. What I'd like to do now is to ask each of you um, for a closing statement because we always try to respect everyone's time. And we know it's a what Tuesday evening and there's any number of other things you all could be doing. But this is uh, the next in a series of conversations that we've been having over the last couple of years. I believe we started these during the pandemic. And next month, we're going to talk about uh, long COVID, L-O-N-G COVID. 
which is really having discussions of the impact that the virus can have on us in the long term, right? So we, as we discuss the phases of a pandemic, the long-term event effects of COVID on one's body, uh, even if we think it's a, 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 a an extreme flu, <laughs> um, what, what it can do. So we're going to have that conversation on Tuesday, September 20th at 7 p.m. Uh, and we're going to make sure that you all invited and we hope you not only come, but you bring a friend with you. And with that, I'd like to start with uh, Dr. Shah, then Dr. Akintobi, then Dr. Griggs to close us out with any final thoughts that you may have. Hey, Dr. Juan, again, very fortunate to be a part of this. And I think this information shared hopefully will we'll take some doubts away, you know, from the audience who is listening to us and inspire them to go and get their vaccines, get immunized. We believe in Walgreens. The prevention is better than cure. And this is the best way to prevent the misery that all the disease state is bringing to us, proactively get immunized. And your neighborhood Walgreens is always going to be there that you can count on. And whenever, if you have any question related to any disease state, our pharmacists are clinically expert to provide the recommendation and proactively protect you. That's, that's what we are proud of our work on. So thank you for this opportunity and really I enjoyed this uh, quite a bit knowledge shared by Dr. Griggs and Dr. Akintobi. So thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Akintobi, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So thanks again for, for all who are participating and thanks to 100 Black Men. You know, we're talking a lot about COVID, um, getting vaccinated, and, and certainly we, we, we are doing this to encourage those behaviors. Uh, but there's so many other things that have paused uh, maybe some of what we were doing in terms of taking care of all of the other ways that help to determine our health, right? So make sure that in spite of the pandemic and as we, we move collectively forward, that you go and see your doctor, right? That you don't neglect and manage your other chronic conditions like diabetes um, or high blood pressure, those things that create the co-occurring opportunity for exposure to, to COVID-19. Um, and I would just leave you, so let's not remember, let's not forget all of those other things that we need to do to mind our health. And there is one part of our health that a vaccination cannot fix, and that is our neck up mental and behavioral health. And the toll that the pandemic has taken on us requires us to, to make sure that when we're not feeling well, uh, that we talk to someone um, uh, to make sure that we are attending to mental, our mental and behavioral health. There is no health without our mental and behavioral health. So just a reminder to all of us and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Griggs. <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, prior to COVID, uh, my platform was get checked, get fit, get moving. Uh, go to your doctor, climb your family tree, ask about maladies. You'd be surprised what you'll find and what you can prevent. Eat healthy foods. Uh, exercise, drink your water, listen to your mom, call your mom, <laughs> all of those things. And most importantly, get sleep. We can't forget that we are still in the middle of a fight and the things that have gotten us here are the things that will get us through. We want you to get, to get vaccinated, understand that there's going to be information flying left and right, and understand that this is science. And it's called an art for a reason. Uh, things are going to change. And we have to be willing to change with it. And though you're tired of hearing it, we're going to keep saying it. Eat your veggies, wash your hands, wear your mask, get vaccinated, and we'll be here whether you asking for a test or asking for treatment. And I yeah. stuck to my story, I told you. <clears throat> did, you did. And I would be remiss if I didn't put up this flyer that, that go along with what Dr. Griggs just said about us being active and being engaged. So we're holding our first ever 5K Run for Tomorrow that benefits our mentoring program in Gwinnett, Cobb, and North Fulton on October 15th. And if I could show you the sponsors, Walgreens is one of our great partners for this event. And we want to thank you all for your ongoing partnership with Walgreens. We want to thank Morehouse School of Medicine, Georgia Seal and HealthWorks for, for 
helping us to help the community get informed and get vaccinated. And I love the fact that I get to work with Dr. Eric Briggs on the National Health and Wellness Committee and all the work he's doing, not only here, he's been to Turks and Caicos. And we think of it, oh, this is this wonderful place, like the background for Dr. Shah. But because of the diets and things there, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, even in that tropical paradise are becoming more and more prevalent. And he, along with other members of our National 100... Black Men Health and Wellness Committee are down there educating and helping out that community. So again, I want to thank you all on behalf of our president, Bernard Johnson, for attending today. We look forward to seeing you next month when we talk about long COVID, the long-term effects of the COVID-19 vaccine on our bodies. And again, thank you all for coming. This session is being recorded. You'll be able to see it through Morehouse School of Medicine's Prevention Resource Center site. We're sending it to Dr. Shah, Dr. Griggs, as well as our uh, websites and social media pages for the 100 Black Men of North Metro Atlanta. Thank you again. Let's continue this work and have a great night.